Nearly the entirety of the story of Ursula K. Le Guin's second Earthsea novel, The Tombs of Ottawan, is set on that island in the Kargish lands. And if we count the waters around it in the last chapter, we can say that the entirety of the story is set there, which means that we should talk about the, the nature of these lands and its society. And we got introduced to them very briefly in two ways in the earlier novel, A Wizard of Earthsea, where uh, Ged, the, the young uh, soon-to-be mage who winds up being a main character in this story as well, living on Gaunt, his island is invaded by Kargish warriors who are there to, to pillage, to, to take, to kill, and perhaps to uh, enslave the occupants of the island. Later on, on the island of Roke, we find that the master namer is himself a karg. He's got a very long name that doesn't actually mean anything. And that's all that we really get about those people set on these islands way to the north and, and east uh, in, in the archipelago who have their own distinct way of life and are set apart from the rest of the archipelago. There, there are differences, of course. Uh, Oskol to the north is a different kind of place than you know, some of the southern uh, islands, let alone Pendor to the west. But the Kargish lands are really their own thing. And Ursula K. Le Guin, in conversations and, and writings about this, says, well, you know, I didn't do much with them in the first novel, and then I decided I'd set the second novel there. So it's distinct from the rest of Earthsea. It's set apart as four main islands, Carrego At, where the power center is, which is also the uh, westmost, and so you know raiding parties can go out from there quite easily. Atuan, where the main action takes place in this story, very close to uh, Carrego At. And then further uh, north and east of these are Her At Her and At Nini. You notice that there's a repeated term in each of these, the At thing. So that's part of their language. We don't actually get much of their language, just a few name places and names of people and words in this. So it's not as if Le Guin is, is world building in that way. But she does tell us an awful lot about their viewpoints. There is, you could say, a world within the world of Earthsea that consists in the Kargish lands. Part of this has to do with ethnicity. So Le Guin made a deliberate decision when thinking out Earthsea to make the majority of the archipelago non-white people. Um, race doesn't have the same import uh, in her world that it often does in ours, but different people have different skin colors. So Vetch is nearly black. Uh, Ged is described as having a copper tone to his skin. Um, even the people that are quite light-skinned are sallow or yellowish. Uh, for example, um, Sarat, the, sorcerer, the sorceress on Gaunt and then up in, in Oskil. Um, the people on the Kargish Islands are very, very light-skinned. And, you know, uh, one of them, uh, the friend of Arha, is described as, like, turning cherry red when she engages in exertion from the blood going to, to her her face. So there's, there's skin color and the um, inhabitants of the Kargish lands distrust the dark people. They don't distrust them because they're dark. They distrust them for all sorts of other reasons as we're going to talk about. Language. The Kargs have their own distinct language which they know and very few people outside of their territories know. And they generally don't speak the languages of the rest of Earthsea, uh, whether it's the main tongue that's, that's spoken there, which is descended from the old tongue, or any of the other dialects that are uh, used among people. So that's something that sets them apart. And they have a very negative view 
of non-cargs. Part of this could be the typical ethnocentrism that we see in almost all peoples, right? But it, it also stems from, as we learn, their history and a, a view of people from what they call the inner lands, the inner lands being all the rest of Earthsea, as engaging in things that are unsavory, dark arts, forbidden arts, things that are not all right to do. And so one of these is magic. There are no wizards or witches or sorcerers or anything like that. As a matter of fact, what we see when the, one of the greatest of, of mages is there, Erath Akba, uh, is he's not opposed by a wizard. He is opposed by a high priest. And it's wizardry versus the gods, not wizardry versus wizardry. So the Kargish people, they have a very complex and kind of um, you know, developing, you could say, over time religion, but they, they don't use sorcery. They're set apart from the rest of Earthsea by that. And they view people who, who do use sorcery as you know, very bad people. Um, same thing with writing. It's, it's talked about by Arha as a black art. It's something accursed that you don't really use. So all of the things that they're memorizing, they are keeping up in their minds, sort of like the, the mages who study at Earthsea, although there's a library there as well. And at one point, Ged actually tells Arha, you know, the art of writing is, in fact, very useful. That's how I found out how to get into the tombs and, you know, uh, how to avoid the, the problems that other people ran into. There's also a difference in how they view life and death. This is really fundamental. This is going to be more or less just referenced here or assumed and then explained much more in the later Earthsea volumes. Cargs, when they die, don't believe and in reality don't go to the dry land. They are reincarnated. They are born again as another person. In the case of Arha, it's a priestess who is reborn in bodies over and over again through millennia. In the case of others, for example, Pentha says, oh, I have to be a priestess in this life. I don't like that. Hopefully I can be a dancing girl next time around, you know, and I'll get to live a little bit, right? So they have a very different attitude about life and death. Um, we don't th think in the story that they still have any dragons left in um, the Kargish lands, although they may have had some in the past. And in place of the use of magic, religious rituals and beliefs also centered on temples and, and a hierarchy play a central role in Kargish life. The religious um, sites could be used as places for truces, places to consult the gods. That's how Atuan becomes such an important place for the cult of the nameless ones. And so what we've got represented until the 11th chapter is this, you know, very different a religiously haunted land which is hostile to outsiders and goes and raids them. Now, how did things wind up like that? Well, there's, there's a, a backstory and there's a, a present. So let's start in the present itself. We know that there is now a Kargad empire, and this is why they can raid places like Gaunt. And um, we find that... Here we go. Um, this is discussed uh, by Manan telling Arha something. Long ago, before our four lands joined together into an empire, before there was a god king over us, there were a lot of lesser kings, princes, chiefs. They were always quarreling with each other. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in, in a moment. And then after a while, the priest kings came to rule all of Karego At, and soon they were ruling Atuan. And now for four or five lifetimes of men, the god kings 
have ruled all the four lands together and made them an empire until things have changed. The god king can put down the unruly chiefs, settle all the quarrels himself. Being a god, he doesn't have to consult the nameless ones very often. So what's going on there? We have the rise, essentially, of a theocracy, right? A uh, priestly uh, lineage that is also the political rulers uniting the four Kargish islands together and uh, if not completely wiping out, at least settling the places and scores between all the other people who matter, the nobility. And so the, the cult of the God King becomes the most important religious uh, you know, ceremonies, uh, rulership, uh, hierarchy within the Kargish lands in Arha's time. And this is what allows the priestess Kassel, who is the priestess of the God King there at, at Atuan, to arrogate more power for herself. She actually says the nameless ones, they're old, they don't have any power anymore. But what we know from this same thing is that the nameless ones were a much more early religion. So as uh, Manan says, they'd come from, from here, to, they'd come here to settle their quarrels. That's how it was. They'd come from our, from our land, Atuan, Karego At, Atnini, and even from her at her, all the chiefs and princes with their servants and armies. They'd ask you, the priestess, what to do. And you'd go before the empty throne and give them the counsel of the nameless ones. So in a divided ethnicity, a divided kingdom set apart against the rest of the archipelago, the nameless ones and its religion, its cult, headed by a priestess, had a very important role. Now they're largely neglected except at Atuan itself. As I mentioned, the priestess of the god king gets to uh, denigrate them and then is cursed by Arha. There is also a third important uh, religious cult that's mentioned, that of the twin brothers. And as we're going to find out, the god king thing comes out of the cult of the twin brothers, who were probably originally heroes, sort of like deified uh, human beings like Hercules or Castor and Pollux in uh, Greek and, and Roman, and, and so many other things. You might think of Ogun in Ifa, Yoruba, um, uh, mythology and religion, you know, uh, not, not starting out as a god, but becoming a god. So all of this is going on. And as some are going up, others are going down. As the kingdom is becoming more unified under those who hold power, others are um, suffering because of that. There is a story of the Kargish lands uh, being divided and being invaded by the archipelagans. This is Castle and Thar telling uh, Arha about it. Um, this is before the god kings ruled the Kargish lands. We were not so strong then. The wizards used to sail from the west to Karego, At, and Atuan to plunder the towns on the coast, loot the farms, even come into the sacred city, Awabath. They came to kill dragons, they said, but they stayed to rob towns and temples. And then Thar says, and their great heroes would come among us to test their swords and work their ungodly spells. And they tell the story of how uh, one of the greatest of, of sorcerers, Erith Akba, comes with his staff and his ring and fights against, uh, well, he, he gets involved in politics, in, in the local politics, uh, warring against each other. And he winds up trying to take the city. Um, and this, this brings about a conflict with the high priest in Tothin, which ends up breaking the ring, which, which is the pretext for the entire quest that Gad is on, right? It's the central part of the story. And over time, what we see is this culture hero, this uh, protector of at least his city becomes viewed as the protector of the land. And the lineage of this high priest in Tothin, originally a priest of the twin brothers, is going to lead to the god kings who now have ruled uh, the Kargish lands for four or five lifetimes. So quite a long time, perhaps several hundred years. 
And this also leads to the destruction of some of the other independent Kargish houses, in particular that of Thorag. We find out in the very end there is the tale of Ged who met up with the two uh, people on the island, a third Kargish encounter, you could say. And we find in towards the end of the book um, that the, that Thar told Arha that uh, during the the time of the priest kings and the god kings, all this time the house of Thoreg, the one that Erith Akbar was, was associated with, uh, grew poorer and weaker. And so at last Thar told me there were only two of the lineage of Thoreg left, little children, a boy and a girl. Um, and so the god king had them stolen from their place and Hapan didn't want to kill them directly and so abandoned them on an island that was little more than a sandbar. They were named Ensar and Anthil, and it was Anthil who gave Ged the ring. So there's this entire backstory. And when we learn this backstory, whether it's reliable or not, we can get a sense perhaps why it's not just you know, ethnocentrism or you know, kind of a distrust in general of, of foreigners, but there's also this, this back history that tells us why the Kargs don't like anybody else. They don't like the people from the Inner Isles. They're also kind of mistaken about the nature of the Inner Isles, and there's a really interesting conversation between um, Ged and uh, uh, Arha about that where he, he fills her in and he says that, um, here we go. <clears throat> what, um, she, she says that um, uh, it would be foolish if such things went on, the raiding that's happening between the Kargish Empire and the Inner Lands. What would the God King do with uh, so many slaves? And Ged says, if the Kargish lands defeated the archipelago, you mean? She nodded. I don't think that's likely to happen. But look how strong the empire is, that great city with its walls and all its men. How could your land stand up against them if they attacked? And Ged says to her, that's not a great city. I, too, would have thought it tremendous when I was new from my mountain. But there are many, many cities in Earthsea, among which this is only a town. There are many, many lands. You will see them, Tenar. And the, the point there is that the Kargish lands, there's an insularity, pun intended, to them. They don't realize how vast what they're calling the inner lands actually are. They're one of the you know, s smaller locations in Earthsea. And I would like to end by bringing up the village that they go to. One of the, the things that this shows is... Yes, there are some vast differences between the Kargs and the rest of the people in the archipelago. This is going to raise some real issues for Tenar as she is leaving her land and going out to you know, Havnor and uh, the rest of, of Earthsea. Eventually, she's going to settle in Gant. But what we find is that the villagers <clears throat> are really not that different from place to place, that there's a shared human reality. <clears throat> Ged puts them under a glamour that hides their, their nature, the fact that he's an outsider and the fact that she's a priestess, and then they beg for supper. They left the, the village the next morning with full stomachs after a pleasant sleep in a hayloft. The mages often beg, asked Tenor, why do you ask? You seemed used to begging. In fact, you were good at it. Well, yes, I've begged all my life, if you look at it this way. Wizards don't own much, you know. In fact, nothing but their staff and clothing if they wander. They are received and given food and shelter by most people gladly. They do make some return. What return? Well, that woman in the village, I cured her goats. What was wrong with them? They both had infected udders. I used to herd goats when I was a boy. Um, and then she says, I see your magic is not good only for large things. And then Ged says, hospitality, kindness to a stranger, that's a very large thing. Thanks are enough, of course, but I was sorry for the goats. And now notice that the hospitality that they're enjoying is not because he's a wizard. It's precisely because he's not viewed as a wizard that these common people are willing, even though they don't have much, to take others in and help them out on their journey. And this helps keep life 
going in, in the uh, entire place. So we've got this great, you know, political and religious stuff on the higher, you could say, elite trickle down level. And then we end by looking at how things are for the common people, which is where the story actually began with the little girl, Tenar, who's going to become Arha, the priestess, being taken from her village, being taken from her parents, who are so poor that they don't even own the place that they live in and farm. So this gives you at least some sense from this book of what the Kargish lands and culture are like. We're going to learn more in later novels and short stories of Earthsea, but that's, that's enough for what we see in the tombs of Atuan.